Maybe seated. Good morning and welcome. We're so glad you're here today to share with us in this day of worship. And um, we're, if you're a visitor with us today, you're a very special guest. We'd love if you would fill out a visitor card for us. That way we get to learn your name. And um, we'd love for you to do that. You can leave it on the pew rack, pew in front of you. There should be some in the pew racks as well. Or you can put it in one of our offering boxes around the back of the church. But uh, we're glad you're here. Wow. How many days do you think it is until spring? <laughs> 63 days until spring. We woke up this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm not a weather czar, and I can never figure out what the weather's going to do. But I heard everything from one inch to 17 inches. And so I woke up this morning, and I peeked out. <laughs> I peeked out of the window thinking, wonder if I'm snowed in. And, you know, some people would like that idea. Of course, myself, you know, being snowed in on a Sunday morning, that just wouldn't work, right? You know, I kind of thought that, well, maybe sleep in day, but not so. But I'm glad I was able to come. 
and uh, hope that, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to get any more bad weather, but uh, I just pray that everybody will be safe in it. And, uh, but we're so glad you're here. Uh, just a couple of little announcements. Our marriage seminar began today, uh, and it went really well. We have a lot of people out uh, sick, and I mean a lot of people out. Um, so we certainly need to be praying for our church family and all the flus and COVID and everything else that's out there. Um, also, sign-ups for Disciple Now uh, is going on in the main foyer, February the 18th through the 20th. So any of you that have uh, kids in our youth group and you want them to be a part of that, it's, always, it's been a wonderful ministry over these 30 years um, that they all come together and share a uh, couple of different houses, and they just uh, have a great time, a great weekend of drawing them to Christ. I think that's everything that I have. Let me lead us in a prayer, and we'll continue to worship. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the ability to, to be here. Lord, uh, we just pray for our friends and family who are battling these illnesses, and Lord, who uh, are just... Uh, we just miss them. And Lord, I, I thank you for the miracle of uh, streaming where they can still be with us uh, in spirit and listen and share with us together. And we pray, Lord, for today. We pray as we continue to look at your word that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, let us see wonderful things from your word. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Join me this morning as we open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 9 to 10. For those of you visiting with us, we're working our way through uh, the epistles of Peter, followed by Jude and followed by probably 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. But right now we're in chapter 2. I'd like to read for you verse number 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Lord, open our eyes, help us to see what you want us to see from Peter's perspective as under divine inspiration he wrote these two letters. Help us to receive this word with meekness. Help our souls to feast upon the truths of being chosen. And Lord, we pray today that our eyes will be opened and our understanding, understanding will be given to us about these deep things of God's sovereignty. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Already thus in our look at chapters 1 and partial 
of chapter 2, Peter has already introduced to us the subject of a spiritual house. Verse 5, he talks about that. Christ is the cornerstone of that spiritual house. And we are the spiritual house, the church. Now, uh, he has contrasted for us in the latter part in verse 8. He's contrasted for us those who are believers with those who are not believers. And notice the doom of the unbeliever in verse 8, the last part of it, where it says, For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. How could God be a God of love and send people to hell? That's really the question people ask without really thinking about the fact that it's sin that sends us to hell. It is the sin, it's the violation of God's holiness that makes us deserving of hell. But our Lord Jesus fixed all of that. Our Lord Jesus went to the mat for us and he completed the work of salvation for us so that we do not have to be those in this category of eternal doom. When we come to verse number 9, Peter uses a conjunction, an adversative conjunction, a very strong conjunction with the word but. Those who are disobedient to the word and to this doom, they were also, also appointed but. And he's speaking now to Christians. And remember in verse 1, he's speaking to specific Christians who have been pushed out of their homes, who have been persecuted, who've probably lost everything and have to start life all over again. But he says, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Four things he mentions to them about who they are. And for us, we need to know these things. Now, I can just believe that some of the people in this, uh, listening to this letter being read into these churches, felt like, well, it sure doesn't feel like I'm chosen. How could God allow all of these terrible things to happen to us and our family members? It sure doesn't feel like that we are a chosen race. But this word, this idea, this concept of being a chosen race comes out of the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning in verse 6, listen to these words. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the earth oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by his mighty hand. He redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. He calls them the chosen. Electos. It's the same word that we learn about in verse 1 of, of chapter 1. They are chosen. Now we spent at least three weeks talking about this subject of election in the very beginning of our study here in 1 Peter. It's on the web. If you missed it, uh, to help us understand this very, very difficult subject, um, it might be a help to you. But now, Peter's returning to this subject. And the reason is, is because it's crucial that as Christians, we understand that salvation is based upon the sovereign, electing purpose of God. And Scripture makes this very, very clear. Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. Listen to as Paul writes here. Chapter 9 and verse 13. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? 
Meganoito, may it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend upon the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It's all God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse number 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. These baby Christians in Corinth that were so immature and had to learn lessons over and over and over again, he says to them here, you were called into fellowship with God's only son. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And Ephesians is both chapters. Uh, you can't help but come into contact with this subject by reading this letter that has been called the bank of the believer. Why? Because it is so rich and deep in theology. Uh, verses 3 to 5 in chapter 1. Listen to what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention, and here it is, of his will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And verse number four, four. Knowing, knowing brethren, brethren, beloved, beloved by, God, by God, his choice, his choice of you. Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse number 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren. Once again, beloved, and that's in a perfect tense. That means action in the past with continuing results. This is something God did from the past. We're the beloved by the Lord because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this that he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus, here it is, from all eternity. You have been in God's heart, beloved. If you are a Christian, you have been in his heart from the very beginning before Adam was even created, you were in his heart and you were chosen to be his as a love gift to his son. But John MacArthur, is, he writes this so well, but he suggests at least five superlatives related to God's sovereign choice to save sinners. Now when I hear the, the word superlative, which is above and beyond, I think of the word superfluous, which means very shallow. Well, one Sunday morning as I was leaving the church, a retired minister was here, and he was sitting at the back, and I shook hands with him, and he says, man, that was superfluous, and I didn't catch it. And as I got out the door, he said, you didn't, you, you didn't hear the word I used, did you? And I said, yeah, I think I did. And he said, I said, superfluous. And I thought, oh, it was shallow? <laughs> but anyway, whenever I see these two words, I get them mixed up. But here they are. Certain things here. First, election is absolutely the solitary decision of God. Thus, it is the most pride-crushing truth in God's word. It devastates human pride since nothing in their salvation derives from any merit in them. It is all of God. This is what makes religions that are based on works, Catholicism is one of them, that's what, what it, 
it completely takes out of God's sovereign purpose and plan and puts it all on my ability to keep the sacraments, to climb the ladder, to, to do the ordinances, to do all the things. And we say that no, our salvation comes from God and from God alone. It's all God. Secondly, because election is totally by divine grace, it is the most God-exalting doctrine. Because when you look at your salvation and you say, it's all God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Third, election is the most holiness-promoting doctrine. Because God set his love on believers before the world began, they should be consumed with gratitude and a passion to obey him, no matter what. Fourth, because God's election is eternal and unchangeable, it is the most strength-giving doctrine in the Bible. Therefore, it affords believers genuine peace, no matter what circumstances they face. And finally, election is the most joy-producing spiritual privilege because it is the surest hope believers have in the midst of a sinful world. Beloved, if he has chosen me, is he not responsible for me? Is that not a wonderful thought? Philippians 1, 6, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which began a work in you will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If he has chosen me, absolutely yes, I am in his hand. He is responsible for me. So, Peter gives them the first of four things. You are a chosen race. Next, he calls them a royal priesthood. This also comes out of the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6, where they are called, the children of Israel were called a kingdom, which is the same word royal and kingdom, a kingdom of priests. Now, I mentioned this last time, but in the early days there, in the early chapters of Exodus, God identified all of the Israelites, and let's just say that there was a million and a half of them. Some believe that that's how many left Egypt. Let's say there was a million and a half. God waved his hand over that million and a half, and he said, you are a holy priesthood. You are a kingdom of priests. Each and every one of you. And then, for Lord knows what reason, Moses left them to go to the mountain and they made the golden calf. And that golden calf, when Moses came down, the scripture says he ground it to powder and he made them drink it. And from that point on, God chose only the Levitical line to be the priestly line. Now, when Christ came and he establishes his kingdom, we are now a royal priesthood. Each and every person has a priesthood status, just like the early Israelites. We are now subjects of the king of kings. Every person a priest. Now, I did a little reading about this, and again, I don't wish, I have some uh, Roman Catholic friends that we disagree on Scripture, and we disagree on a whole lot of Scripture, but they would agree in this passage that, yes, we are a kingdom of priests, but they call us common priests. And to be other than a common priest, you have to dress differently. Now, I found this out, too. The little black outfit with the white collar, that's provided by the church. And that's all the man wears. As far as I know, that's all he wears. I don't know if that should set a precedent for the church buying my clothes. I mean, it's there. You can think about it. I mean, I like nice stuff. But where they differ is that they say that this man is a higher priest. And they put a, a chasm between laity and the clergy, of which we do not. I'm only up on this platform to make it easier for you to hear and see. But I am on, on common ground with each and every one of you. And I am indeed a priest. 
but I do not have to dress differently. And that's why they wear the black and the collar, so that people will identify them as different. Can you imagine Jesus looking different than the other disciples? Nowhere in the Bible do I see this difference. In the Old Testament, yes. Under the Old Covenant, yes. But we're in the New Covenant. Every single one of us is part of this priesthood. And this title brings out our personal relationship that we have with our King. So, beloved, listen, you, you, are, you are indeed a royal priesthood. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. And the third thing he calls them here is a holy nation. Now, Israel, they were seldom holy. And what I mean by holy, hagios here, is the word that means different, um, uniquely separated. Um, it's not this idea of having a, you know, a glow about you. That's not the type of word that this means. This is something where we are different. But Israel started out being different. They would remember their tithe. They would give tithes for the poor. They would establish all of the sacrifices. They would let their land rest every seventh year, as the Old Testament specified. But soon they got to realize that, wait a minute, we're losing a whole year of opportunity to plant crops. What's the big deal if we just plant our crops on this next year? Let's see what happens. And God had promised them that if they would obey him, that that year of letting the land rest, the year before, he would give them ample grain for that year. But they started getting greedy, and they started looking at their lives separate from their identity in God. And as a result, two major captivities, the Babylonian captivity was all about this land tithe, 490 years worth of time. And so God took his tithe out of that 490 years that they disobeyed him, and they were placed in Babylon for 70 years. Israel started out right. What happened to them? They were a holy nation. We used to be, maybe, a God-fearing nation. Not anymore. I think it's safe to say that probably everybody in this room, maybe everybody listening to me online, probably is a God-fearing person. But our world is wicked, and it's getting worse. And evil is spoken of as good. Sin is accepted and approved. And right now, even today, I believe, this, is this the 17th? No, that's, I guess, tomorrow. Some, in Canada, I think today that there is a law that actually is put into place where I can't speak this way from the pulpit. I'd be arrested, and I'd put in, be put in jail. I'd be fined. Maybe the church doors would be closed. I don't know. But how much longer is it going to be until we are in this situation? Here's a question. Do you think God's judgment is falling on our nation, our world, because of our disregard of the sanctity of life, because our disregard for marriage between a man and a woman? Do you think all of the calamities that are happening, COVID and all the rest of them that's coming, all the disasters, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, the, the fires, the, the tornadoes, all of the things that seem to be increasing and increasing, do you think this could be the judgment of God falling? I don't know. I really don't know. And I'm certainly not up here to create fear and panic, but only to call our attention to the fact, friends, we've left the status of being a United States of America, a God-fearing nation. I hope that our church, and I know this church will not depart from it, but I know many churches that have already departed from the truth of God's word concerning marriage and concerning abortion and all of the other things. So, he's telling them here they're a chosen race. They're a royal priesthood. They should have been a holy nation. We should be a holy nation. 
And then fourthly, a people for God's own possession. Now this comes out of Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 21. And Malachi chapter 3 and verse 17. I found something interesting here where it says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and the next thing, a people for God's own possession. In the King James, it says, a peculiar people. <laughs> in 1611, the word peculiar meant things that belong to you, things in change in your pocket. That was peculiar to you. But since then, that word has taken on a twist. If you have someone say, your pastor's peculiar, well, you might say, yes, he is. Or you might say, well, what, what makes you say that? Because the word has, has changed in its, in its semantics, its, its meaning. So the a New American Standard does this really well, where they express this by saying that, uh, that you are a people for God's own possession. A peculiar people, yes, but meaning by that term, you belong to God. And that's what we're supposed to understand, that we are his, much like the pearl of great price, much like the treasure hid in the field. It's that idea. And what has he called us to? We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And there is a reason in it, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. What has he called us to do? Each and every one of us he has called to be an evangelist or missionary. He's called each and every one of us to shine the light like the light on the hill, the city that it should be a light to everyone. He's called us. He's called us to witness He's called us to share our faith. He's called us to exhibit truth and honesty and kindness and generosity. In our marriages, we've started our marriage class, and John Gottman, who is someone that we read a lot about marriage material or get a lot of marriage material from, and he said that the two common denominators for great marriages are kindness and generosity. I wonder if that same thing is true about us who are proclaiming God's virtues, his excellencies, because God is both of those things in our lives. So what is it that makes you different than the people you work with? What is it that this selfish world can see in you to say, you're not like everyone else? And why was it what was it that God wanted from the Israelites? Very simple. Just follow my ways. Follow my word. Teach my word to your children when they get up in the morning, when they walk through the day, when they retire at night, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Make sure that there's plenty of God talk, Jesus talk, in your home, in your marriage, even at your job, whenever that is allowed. Because there are people out there that they don't know. Just, just this Saturday, and I try to do this consistently. I, I fail a lot of times, but I consistently try to be a witness with my words. And I was seated at breakfast on the counter next to a guy that I didn't know. And so... You know, as I just talked to people, and I just asked him who he was. He told me. And, of course, I asked him, uh, are you retired? He looked to be a retirement age, and he said yes. I said, what did you do? And uh, on and on, the conversation went kind of back and forth. And then it came to the point of me asking him if he was a Christian or does he worship in some church. And I was really surprised to hear him say, no, I'm not. I'm not. And he said it in such a way that I, oh, you know, I, I certainly don't want to start off this conversation by offending somebody, but I do want to tell them about my Christ. And so I said, well, were you raised here? He said, born and raised. And I said, well, surely there's a church that you've attended. I mean, 
We've got so many churches in our town like Carter's Liver, little, liver Pills. Some of you don't even have any idea what that is. But those little tins have hundreds of them in there. And so he said, I was raised Mormon. My family's Mormon, but I'm not. I'm nothing. And I'm thinking in our little town, there's a guy sitting there at breakfast that I'm praying that God will allow me to get to know, not to be a target for me, but to be able to introduce him to the light that I have in my heart. And beloved, that's what God has called us to do, to follow his ways, to proclaim the excellencies, plural, of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if I am in the light and walking in the light, God is going to take me to people to witness to, to share with, to be generous with, to be kind to, to be able to help and be a help. So this is, I believe, what we're to do. We're also called throughout the Bible to praise him. Now you're here this morning and we sang these wonderful songs and that last one, how great they are. If that didn't ring the bells in your belfry, then there's something wrong with you. That's just such a great song about God, about his greatness. And so to follow his ways, yes, means of us to be a light, but to praise him and to praise him consistently and to be a part of a church and serve a church. Israel kept the light to herself. She was supposed to shine with all of these pagan lands around her. She was supposed to shine and show people the light of God. And Israel failed. And God removed her and raised up a new people. And this new people, the Gentiles, we were called out of darkness into the light. John 5, 24. So, basically, verse 10 ends with, he's talking to these exiles. Just remember, there was a time in your life when you did not know Christ. And maybe I'm speaking to you this morning. And your mind is taking you back to those times where you didn't know him and you weren't drawn to him. But you are now. And you are the people of God. I want to be that type of person who had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, which is sanctifying grace. So look at what Peter has said to these exiles. He's built them up in their belief. He's challenged them. He's equipped them to be able to find out what their purpose and focus is. And he ends on this high note of don't forget that this mercy was given to you. So this morning, as we continue our walk through this book of 1 Peter, I hope and pray that God will draw you. If you're not a believer, my prayer is, is that through this spoken word, God's word will draw you to himself. You won't come any other way. Scripture makes that very, very clear. Unless the Father draws you and changes your disposition, you will not come. And so if God is drawing you, I hope and pray that you will take that step. Pray the sinner's prayer, which is really two things. It's an acknowledgement of your sin, which God has to show you. And secondly, it's an acknowledgement of your faith in the finished work of the cross. So if God has opened your heart, you know that you're a sinner, reach out to him and say, Jesus, I know I have sinned. And today I know and believe with all my heart. As a matter of fact, I'm staking my entire life upon the fact that what you did on the cross satisfied God. And when you believe those two things, beloved, you are indeed the elect. You are indeed the chosen. 
You are indeed the people of God. So let's just a moment of quiet. Think about what you've heard this morning about these wonderful things of God's kingdom. Ruminate on them, pray about them, and in a few moments we'll close with our final song.
Thank you so much for being here today, for sharing with us in this day of worship. I hope this is the start of a great week for you. And I pray that each and every one of us will take this light, the light that Christ has given us in our hearts, and will shine it brightly. And throughout whatever situation we go through this week, that God will be glorified through the way that, that we approach it and handle it. Let's sing our doxology together, and Pat Ballard, you're up. Okay. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.